You are listening to the Fine Food and Healthy Living Asia podcast, where we talk about fine food and healthy living throughout Asia. So let's get started. Hey everybody, Ian and Todd here. Welcome to the Fine Food and Healthy Living Asia podcast. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for coming. The Fine Food and Healthy Living Asia podcast is produced every week for your enjoyment and show notes are found on our Facebook page. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram or on my blog, ToddInAsia.com. That's Todd with two Ds in Asia.com. All links are in the show notes. Now, let's get started. We're here at Kitchen by Food Rebel with my co-host Ian Nenke. Ian, great to see you today. Great to see you too, Todd. How have you been? Very well, thank you. Excellent. A little bit hot and sweaty today. Yeah, and Singapore is a little muggy today. Also joining us for this week's podcast is my partner and, full disclosure, the love of my life, Rochelle Gehring. She's a functional medicine nurse practitioner and joining us for today's podcast. Hello, Rochelle. How are you? Great. Thank you, Todd. Our special guest today is Alika Tasker, and she owns Kitchen by Food Rebel. And just by way of a small story, Rochelle and I were actually our first week in Singapore and looking for bulletproof coffee because we're sort of bulletproof coffee addicts. So we Googled it and up popped Kitchen by Food Rebel, and we just made our way down here to Stanley Street and found it and just fell in love with this place. I mean, it's everything we love in a restaurant in food and nutrition and come to find out Alika also is a health coach and does online videos about food and nutrition and she's the whole package. So Alika, a very warm welcome to the show. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. My first question is why Kitchen by Food Rebel? What what does that mean to you? Yeah, so the name, is that what you mean? Yeah. Um, Well, I don't know what it was like for you growing up, but for me, I always found myself navigating towards the kitchen and I always felt like the kitchen was one of those places that in a family home everybody just felt together. Um, That was one of the first things that popped into my head when we were talking about names and I remember at that time there were a lot of names popping up as you do when you're starting a business Um, and one of the things that was most important to me here was creating a space that we could educate people because that's what I felt was most missing uh-huh. in terms of the health scene in Singapore. So the other reason behind calling it kitchen was because the kitchen is actually the big enough, the biggest space in the cafe, uh-huh. which to most experienced F&B operators, food and beverage operators, they are clearly making the seating space the biggest space. So the kitchen allows us now to do cooking classes and to really use that space to educate and that's it. Um, and then the food rebel bit was actually um, two um, individuals that had started with me when we started the business that were chefs at the time. And they had previously run a business called Food Rebels with an S. Um, and I looked, that name just felt so good. But what I thought about that name was it became a lot about them as individuals being rebels against the world. And I really felt that the individual should be the rebel and the individual should know that they have choice and the individual therefore is the rebel and so that's why it became by food rebel and you mentioned cooking classes do you do those regularly or and and how many people are involved and it sounds it sounds like a great concept great idea because you don't often see it in many of the restaurants over here very Very rare very true the cooking classes has been a challenge because it's really what I need to do to push this business forward in in the vision that I've had when I set it up of education but I've had the demand and not the ability to reach it which is a good problem Um, but it's still a problem so last year we did roughly a one a month um, and that's been one of my clear visions for this year to move up to a minimum of two a month um, and so, yeah, what we're in, yeah, we're coming towards the end of February, and we've had uh, raw vegan cheese already this month. And this Saturday, we will have raw desserts, 
And how does one sign up for a cooking class or a food class? Yeah, well, we post them all on our Facebook events page because we find that that's the best way to share them. And we do have a newsletter that customers or anyone can sign up to where we always feature the upcoming classes. And the Facebook page, uh, can you tell? Yeah, it's just the Kitchen by Food Rebel. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about your history and your background. Absolutely. So it's always hard to think about when the journey started for me, and it definitely was a journey and is a journey. But I would definitely say it probably started when I moved to Singapore five years ago, and I was a foodie. And if you are a foodie, you'll appreciate that we always think about food. And it doesn't matter whether it's healthy or not, it's just got to taste good. <laughs> And so I was so excited about the thought of coming to Singapore and being here because I could see that the cuisine was like in the forefront of everybody's minds and all the opportunities to try so much variety in the cuisine just screamed to me. And I grew up with a Caribbean background, some history from Costa Rica, in the north of England, in Leeds, where it's a farming city, but it's 20 minutes away from Bradford, which is the largest Indian population in England so you know for me it was that real melting pot of cuisine that was all the way through my palate so I only ate in hawker centers in my first year in Singapore in fact in my first nine months of Singapore I never ate a western meal wow. because I was like trying every single hawker center across the island and I was also in my corporate job then I was in the HR role I was hiring for multinational companies and recruitment and it was a very sales pressurized environment. Um, uh, with the move to Singapore, you know, there was a lot of pressure I'd put on myself to really work extremely hard. And I think Singapore also supports that type of ethic. So in, in, as well as, you know, not necessarily eating the right things, you know, I was fueling the energy with caffeine and sugar and anything that gives you the quick fix, right? And uh, you know, I was becoming overweight, so feeling sluggish and fatigue. And so, you know, you turn to exercise. I'd, I'd always exercised all my life, so I started to run more. And I just could see that nothing was really working. And when I started to look at food was because I signed up for a personal trainer, which to me was a bit of a luxury at the time, but quite common here. Right? And the personal trainer started me on weights. And up until that point, I'd never really done weights. I was more of a runner, to be honest. I, I, I rang for a, cl a local club where I was from. So when I started doing weights, then she started talking to me about macros. I was like, what is this science from the food? Macros, macros, is in macronutrients. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> so when you start talking about how many proteins and grams of fats and carbs, for me as a, just a foodie, this was a whole new concept. But I was amazed at uh, how there was this part of something that I love and am passionate about that I never knew existed, this science to food. And it was through that interest that made me go, I need to know more about this. And I think that, you know, going to a personal trainer, you realize that their time is limited to talk to you about nutrition. So I decided I was going to learn about my nutrition myself. And, you know, it's a subject of food, right? So a subject I'm happy to spend time looking at. And that's what led me to health coaching. Because when I started looking at nutrition, I started learning about all this, this support you get around it, where health coaches are helping people to create healthy lifestyles and teaching them not just nutrition but how to be all-encompassing and holistic and look at every pillar of your health and you know the moment I just looked at that profession I was like oh my god that's my next job wow. and it was that was a light switch like literally immediate reaction I immediately overnight went from I want to be in the most senior position in my consultancy firm I want to probably you know be the country manager and be at the top of my profession to I don't want that. Yeah. Wow. Something lit up inside <laughs> literally, of you. Yeah. Literally. Literally. found a new passion. Completely uh -huh. overnight. And so I pursued a course. Um, I studied for the Institute Inter Integrative Nutrition, which is the largest nutrition school in the world. I spent 12 months studying with them whilst doing my full-time job. I made various lifestyle changes that I now teach my client, which is to work through various pillars of my health. And one of those pillars was to look at, you know, the work that I love. I made a, a change to a bigger company. I realized that actually it was too late, that I needed to change the industry. And so that's when I decided to just focus on actually coaching others. And the others were the people that were like me, the, the burnt out corporate executives that 
were working really hard. They cared about their health, but they just didn't have the information that I now knew and believed that everybody should have. And when I started coaching them, you could just see how they lit up in the same way that yeah. I lit up. And we just kind of knew that, oh my God, like everybody should know this. Yeah. Um, and that's basically how it became the coaching and Alika Fit, which is now my online health coaching business. I don't do as much one-on-one. One -on -one. Now I have a 10-day energy reset program where individuals can get a daily video in their inbox. They get the swap guide, five-step guide, recipes, shopping lists, and all that they need to take. How do you food. do all this and run a restaurant yeah. at the same time? Well, that's, why the same thing. <laughs> that's why I had to move a lot of all that online and, and reduce the one-on-one -on -one because after one year of doing the coaching, all of my clients, I could see the familiarity in what they were saying, which was, we need somewhere that sells the food that you're telling us to eat. And right. the only options we have in Singapore are salad shops. And you're saying that it could be more exciting. You're providing us with recipes, but you can't get that in Singapore. And as an executive working in Raffles Place, I knew what they meant. Yeah. I was, there was two places where I would go to. And I was also thinking when you cook at home from scratch, it's much better than this. So that was the inspiration with knowing that I could open a place that was similar to other places. I mean, this concept existed in Bali, in Australia, in right. the US, but I just felt that people were dipping their toes in here, but not going the full way. And how did it go when you first opened? Was there an immediate rush of people saying, oh, we've been looking for you forever and now you're here, or did it take a while? It took a while to grow the business, but the impact of the, the feedback was immediate. So in the first three to six months, I mean, bearing in mind, I had no industry experience. So I think the first three months was learning how does this type of business operate whilst doing it at the same time. <laughs> Um, and then, so we had about 30 to 40 customers and it just, every month it grew, grew slowly. I had a massive transition in my, after four months where I changed team and I really decided that I needed to go in the direction that was following my heart and not so much necessarily what people were telling me to do. And then at six months in, I fully just went with what I believed, what it should look like. And I changed the menu and I did it. And uh, after six months, that's when it really took off. Nine months later, media started writing to me and coming in and wanting to interview and after nine months it really really took off and we grew to about 90 to 100 customers consistently every day and then after December we walked into 30% growth after our first year no kidding. and it really just yeah took it from there and now this is the start of year three and it, we've just gone well 35% growth from last year already wow that's phenomenal Michelle do you have any questions to ask well, one of the questions I have is it's very hard to find organic food. You know, we go, we probably go to two or three stores and look in their little minute grocery section yeah. to get their organic yeah. uh, produce. Where do you get yours? Yeah, well, we work with a local family farm here called Quan Fa, and I love them. I mean, the nephew is now pretty much running the business with one of the original family members as well. Um, and so, I mean, he personally even delivers vegetables for me. So I work with them and his farm is actually based at Malaysia, um, just mm -hmm. kind of at the border between Malaysia and Singapore. So they provide us with a lot of our organic produce, but really for organic produce and for a restaurant, I don't think you can get enough of what you need for the variety for a menu mm -hmm. from one supplier. So I have to do a lot of um, uh, individual uh, contacts myself. So before I set the business up, I did spend four months doing my business plan and one of the biggest parts of that was finding the suppliers. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I go to everywhere from Mustafa to get my dry pantry goods, things like organic rice syrup in a jar mm -hmm. from Australia at very reasonable price. So I have to do that every two weeks just to get those stuff. Now I've got a brilliant um, supplier who used to work in pharmaceutical company, changed industry, and is now sourcing organic nuts from all over the world. So mm -hmm. she does my nuts and my grains like quinoa and buckwheat. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, last year, it was so much easier for me because the first year was, how do I find these people? The second year, they start coming to you. So anything else that I can't get consistently, because for a menu, it has to be consistent. Mm -hmm. I, if I can't get it consistently organic, then the other main supplier we use is our supplier for the pesticide removal, ETL. And they provide us with a fantastic pesticide removal that was tested on 600 different types of pesticides in a lab in Taiwan. And we use that, actually we use it on organic and non-organic to make mm. it easier. Yeah. So we use that to clean all fruit and vegetables and our tables. 
we sell it in store as part of the merchandise range. I'm wondering if you work with any functional medicine doctors or integrative doctors mm -hmm. in Singapore and if they refer to you. I do. I work really closely with all the people that I can in the health and wellness community because I believe that's critical to success and the mission that I have, which is to improve customers' health. So for me, I, you know, there are two or three functional practitioners that I work really closely with and we do yeah, dual referrals just by sheer nature that sometimes you know, the client needs one of us. Um, I work with the physios, I work with osteopaths, I work with um, Chinese traditional medicine practitioners, I work with um, gym instructors. Um, so yeah, I have this community that I work extremely closely with to be able to give a real all-round support to the client. I have a question for me personally, if I can get some free health coaching advice here. Of course. <laughs> so I feel pretty healthy, healthier than I've probably ever been, in, including when I was a teenager even. And um, a lot of that is in great part, I'm, I have gratitude to Rochelle for kind of showing me the ropes as far as nutrition. and. So I meditate, I exercise, I don't drink alcohol, no caffeine. I mean, like, I look at me and compare me to an aesthetic monk and I'm like, pretty good. But it just seems like I'm, that takes up so much time looking for the right foods, doing exercise every day. You know, where, what's your coaching in terms of balancing all of this and where does fun come in? Absolutely. Well, to, to me, the key to sustainable, healthy lifestyle is balance. So when we talk about food, which is what we were talking about, what you mentioned there mainly was, um, for me, a balance is 80-20 because I don't believe personally that 100% of the time eating perfectly is possible for the modern day person. Um, so I live by 80-20. So 80% 80 of the foods that I eat are real foods grown, used to be alive, or make a noise in the case of meat or fish. And 20% is whatever I want. Yeah. And whatever I want, I always go high quality. So if I want a glass of wine, you're not going to just see me drinking a really poor happy right. hour wine. It's going to be a good Better wine. Be good. Yeah. yeah. If I'm going to have cake, I'm not going to go to just any old how. You know, I don't mind how the cakes are made, processed, high volume. I'm going to go to a really nice patisserie and I'm going to have good cake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for me, by living like this, I, I find that I don't, one, I manage my cravings and two, there's no deprivation. There's no, I can't have. I can have whatever I want. It's just, I choose quality. And the 80% of real food is also quality stuff as well. So let's say, you know, I'm not vegetarian or vegan. So when it's talk, when we're talking about meat, let's say, the, the meat choice that I have, I cannot meet, eat meat anywhere. I don't eat that much meat but, or fish. But when I do, you know, again, you know, I'm, I'm making really smart choices. Great advice. Thank you. Ian? With the success of Kitchen by Food Rebel, what's your plans from here? Are you going to expand the business or maybe franchise or? This one I get a lot. It's so difficult because this is the year to make that, to answer that question and to make that decision. And the truth is I've not made the decision. This is year three and for most F&B operators, that's the year where you get the return. And from then on, you know, you decide really what next. I feel if I follow my gut instinct, for me, the franchise model um, is not what I want for myself. Um, and that's from, because I, I don't think I'm a typical F&B operator. I operate the business in a way that is very much driven by the purpose of educating the customer, uh, hence the kitchen space. <laughs> And um, through doing that, we've been lucky enough to achieve great success in the revenue as a byproduct. But um, what I want to do in terms of the way that we cook and we cook in the way that you would at home if you had the time, I don't think that I can have that amount of control and that level of quality with multiple outlets. So that means franchise would be out of the way. Um, multiple outlet, therefore, would be out of the way. And then it's about staying true to the mission, which is education, which, you know, there's only so much you can spread me. So I think what the, the growth theory has to be is me teaching others to run classes, workshops, to educate, and for me to move as much stuff online as possible so that there's a an, uh, an wider forum to share that information. To help create a movement in Singapore. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Do you have any events you mentioned the cooking class coming up on Saturday and anything coming in the near future. This will probably be uh, up on Friday. So anything after that you'd like to talk about? On the 28th, um, I'm working with a 
an amazing startup that believes some some similar concepts to myself, like education, called Sapio. And what they do is they have an online app that allows individuals to talk to experienced experts in their field and ask questions and pay to get advice. It's a minimal amount. So I'm their health and wellness expert and on the 28th, I'll be running a uh, talk that is basically how I set up this business and the obstacles I had along the way. Oh, excellent. Wow. Yeah. That's February so, 28th yeah, here? And that, that in, at Food Rebel, yeah. And so that will be shared also on our Facebook events page. Okay, great. And then website and address and yeah. ways to contact? Yeah, so the best way to contact me is at elikafit at gmail.com. Um, my Instagram handle is elika.fit. My Facebook handle is elikafit and my website is elikafit.com. And the address here? 28 Stanley Street, which is Tala Aye. So we're a couple of minutes walk from both Tanjampaga um, and Tala Aye MRT stations. Again, wanted to say how much we really respect and love what you're doing here. And just, uh, you know, coming from America where we had our Whole Foods mm, outlet, yeah. you know, that was so great. I just dream about the thought yeah. of having Whole Foods in I know. Singapore. We still, we dream too. But, but we found this, and this yeah. is just so great. Thank, Thank you for you. having it here. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to mention? No, okay. no, that's yeah. fine, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, and, uh, well, all listeners out there, do be sure to drop down by uh, yeah, Kitchen by Food absolutely. Rebel. Check it out. We've got an amazing menu. Uh, we have, we just had some, some lunch just previously, but um, it's, a, it's a great place to be. Very good. Okay, thank you so much, Alika. Okay, thank take you. care. If you're enjoying the Fine Food and Healthy Living Asia podcast, please consider supporting us by going to our homepage at www.finefoodandhealthylivingasia.com and making a donation. We are beginning a new way to support the show by subscribing as a loyal member. Another option on our homepage at finefoodandhealthylivingasia.com. There are options to choose for the level of support you wish to give. We will always make our podcasts available for free and appreciate your patronage to be able to do so. If you subscribe with iTunes, please remember to give us a five-star rating. If you have not yet subscribed, please do so and then give us a five-star rating. For other subscribers on Google Play, Spotify, or any other aggregators, please rate us there. Once again, thank you for listening to the show.